welcome back to Castle Lovestead. My name is Jessica and in today's video I'm sharing with you my favorite books of all time. <laughs> booktuber has a favorite books of all time video. I don't. I'm not a good booktuber. So I decided to join y'all's ranks and develop my own favorite books of all time video. Now when I did this I didn't necessarily pay attention to the number of books I was adding to this list. Most people do their top 10 and it just so happens that I ended up with 10 books. <laughs> it wasn't anything I was trying to do. It just was happenstance. So two of the books I don't currently have, I lent them out to someone. And y'all know when you lend out a book, you're never getting it back. So I do need to repurchase them. Two of them are nonfiction. The rest are all fiction. One of them is written by a queer person. And the rest are all written by white folks. So something I definitely need to continue to work on is reading diversely, which I've done a pretty good job of that so far the past few years and I'm hoping that here in 2021 I'll be able to add a few more books to my best books of all time list and that those books will be written by more diverse writers. I'm going to start out with the books that I don't actually own. The first one is The Bell Jar by Sylvia Plath. I feel like most people know what The Bell Jar is about. It is about a young girl who has a job in New York City and she has a mental break. And I read this when I was in high school and I felt so edgy, like so cool. And I carried it around with me like I was just like such an emo. I had an emo phase. I never dressed the part, but I was an inner emo girl. <laughs> so anyway, I think most people are pretty familiar with The Bell Jar, at least people on booktube. It is a modern classic. I love Sylvia Plath just in general. So that is definitely up there in my best books of all time. The second book that I don't currently have is called Fat So by Marilyn Wan. This is about how to live in a fat body, how to love your fat body unapologetically. It also gets into some um, fat phobia, particularly here in the United States. It talks about how fat people are discriminated against not only just in day-to-day -day life but in the medical world as well talks about some of the misconceptions about fat bodies it was a life-changing read for me really important part of my journey to becoming who I am today so that is definitely up there on the list and it's so good I wish everybody had a copy of it hence why I lended it out to someone <laughs> The next work of nonfiction is Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. This book is about finding meaning in whatever circumstance you end up in. It's basically that concept of bloom where you're planted. So Viktor Frankl was a victim of the Holocaust. He was a Jewish man who worked as a doctor prior to going to a concentration camp. And in the concentration camp, he continued to work as a doctor. And he talks about in this book how even in the midst of all of that horror, and human ugliness, he was still able to find meaning in his day-to-day -day life. If he can do that in the Holocaust, we can do that, right, in our everyday lives. Even amidst all the challenges that we may be facing that are valid, um, but are not a concentration camp for most of us, right? So if he can do it, so can we. I know that sounds really cheesy and lame to say, but like he explains actually how to do it in here, which is why I really love this book because it's not just like empty platitudes. It's actually like, here is how you reframe your brain to do what I did. So next we have Hope Leslie or Early Times in the Massachusetts by Catherine Maria Sedgwick. I've talked about this book several times already and I keep ramping it up because nobody else mentions it. This is an early American literature and I think most people dislike early American literature because when you think about early American literature you're thinking like Cotton Mather and Nathaniel Hawthorne and this while touching on a lot of the same themes as early American literature it is way better than all of that. <laughs> Like, it is scandalous, it is exciting, it is action-packed, there's romance, there's heartbreak. It is like a soap opera set in the 1700s. So I absolutely love this book. 
and um, I wish more people read it so that we could talk about it. Night Film by Marisha Pessel. I actually read this book last year and it blew my mind. So when you read the description of this book, you kind of think that, oh, it's just your typical um, police procedural sort of mystery thriller. And it is so much more than that. It's actually, it's multimedia. And it really does such a phenomenal job of like walking the line between fantasy and reality and exploring like when you choose to live in more of a fantasy world versus when you choose to live in strict realistic truth like scientific truth versus spiritual truths and like it is so good it's so good I've heard some critiques of it saying that the characters aren't great the plot is kind of plotting and like I can see how those might be an experience for the reader but like this book teaches us to look deep to like look deeper into the story behind the story and um I do want to do a reread of this sometime soon I'm like itching to reread it I read this in November I want to say no it was over this past summer so it was coming up on a year that I read it but I already am like really wanting to go back and revisit the this book and if I do, I will do a more in-depth, like, review of it as I, as I read it. So, so good. Virginia Woolf by... No. <laughs> Orlando by Virginia Woolf. If you have met my dog, his name is Orlando. And this is where his name comes from. Orlando is such an abstract book. Um, the best way that I can describe it is actually in the book blurb. So let me read it to you. As his tale begins, Orlando is a passionate young nobleman who, nobleman, whose days are spent in rowdy revelry, filled with the colorful delights of Queen Elizabeth's court. By the clothes, he will have transformed into a modern 36-year-old woman. Three centuries will have passed. Orlando will witness the making of history from its edge, dressing in the flamboyant fashions of each day, following passing customs, and socializing with celebrated artists and writers. Orlando's journey will also be an internal one. He is an impulsive poet who learns patience and matters of the heart and a woman who knows what it is to be a man. Virginia Woolf's most unusual and fantastic creation, Orlando is a funny, exuberant romp through history that examines the true nature of sexuality. So that's a really good description of what this book is about. Like I said, it's very abstract. It's almost like trying to have a painting tell you a story in novel form. <laughs> it's the best way that I can describe it. It has been a very long time since I have read this book and it is due for a reread as well. The next is actually a book series rather than a single book, but it is the Wheatsy Bat series by Francesca Leah Block. So I have the bind up of the first several books here called Dangerous Angels and then the last book here, Necklace of Kisses. This is set in Los Angeles and it is also kind of a, um, an abstract, lyrical, fantastical story. A lot of magical realism woven in, a lot of heavy symbolism. But I used to tell people that like if you want to see inside my story, soul read this book series because it's got all of the like bohemian artistic vibes that really make up a large part of who I am. So definitely recommend these if you want to get to know me a little bit better. Read the series. Empire Falls by Richard Russo. This is a Pulitzer Prize winning novel and it is about a small mining town that's really struggling economically. It's very much a slice of life book. And when I read this, I just wanted it to continue. I like, just wanted the book to continue on forever so that I could continue living the life through these characters. I just, it, the town felt so real. The, the people felt so real and dynamic. And a lot of it takes place in this diner. And I am a little bit obsessed with diners. Like if we weren't in the middle of a pandem pandemic, I would be doing a lot of my daily work sitting in a diner. And I would do my work and observe the people around me and observe the things that happen within a diner. Diners are so interesting. Um, just they're their own little cosmos. And, and they have their own rhythm and their own like social structures and 
I just love it. It's so like this is almost like a story within a story because you've got the structures of what's happening within the diner but then the diner is also within this small town and what's happening within that small town. I grew up in a very very small town. I graduated with less than 40 people in my entire graduating class and so I, I deeply related to a lot of the themes and the, the ideas explored in this book. And then last but certainly not least is Stonebutch Blues by Leslie Feinberg. This is a semi-autobiographical novel about a female to male trans man in the 1950s and on up to like the 1980s. And it's almost like historical fiction. It documents the way trans and queer folks are treated from the 1950s on forward, all of the police violence and brutality that happened. And Leslie Feinberg is just one of my absolute heroes in this life. I actually wrote about this book for my master's thesis. So it's very, it's a very well-loved copy here. Um, I was invited to Leslie Feinberg's, I want to say it was their 40th birthday party, and I didn't go. Um, I didn't go because it was in New York City and I was in Iowa and I didn't have the money, but it is one of my greatest regrets that I did not go to Leslie's birthday party when I had the invitation to go um, because Leslie has passed from complications of tick-borne illnesses such as Lyme disease. But Leslie was such an important activist in the LGBTQ community, um, such an important activist for trans folks and for people in the working class, and a big advocate for labor unions, which is something that's pretty heavily explored in this book as well. And we just we just lost a a shining light um, when Leslie passed. So we those of us in the LGBT community would not be where we are today had it not been um, for Leslie's existence. So this book means so much to me and um, I've actually had conversations with Leslie's wife who is a published poet as well and it's just it's it's such an important part of my life. So those are my top books favorite books of all time. If you have done a favorite books of all time video, please link me to that video down below so that I can go watch your video. I think it's a really interesting way to get to know people and to get to know their reading preferences. I realized as I was making this list that I have really strayed from my favorite kinds of books in the past few years. In the past few years, I've really dug into a lot of fantasy and mystery thrillers. And while there's a time and place for those things, and I love those kinds of books, and I think that they, you know, I'm not being a snob about it like I absolutely love them I'm glad that they exist I'm finding myself gravitating back to more of my roots of reading classics and hard-hitting contemporaries um, because all of these are that <laughs> so um, yeah so that'll do it for today's video and until next time make sure to continue to read good books drink good coffee take care of yourselves and each other